I'm John Alvin Wilkins. I'm John Alvin just about everywhere on the internet, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever, uh, Drupal.org. Uh, actually, I'm curious. I know that there's a lot of Drupal people here. Um, how many people have used Drupal or use it as day jobs? That's pretty good. Probably hate it at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> sure, 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 sure. <laughs> So the people in the Drupal community have really, really taken a love to SaaS. Um, so I'm not surprised that there, there are a bunch of them here. Um, not so much less love in the Drupal community. So <laughs> we got that going for us. Um, I live in Taiwan uh, with my wife and two kids. And we don't actually own any lemurs. Um, but uh, I did get to go visit a place. Uh, in Taiwan, where you actually can go in and like play with lemurs, this is awesome. You should definitely come visit Taiwan. <laughs> um, so, uh, I am a big proponent of open source software, um, and I've written a bunch of stuff. So, um, like the SaaS relevant stuff is Zen Grids. Um, this is a, a layout um, com component SaaS extension. Sorry, Compass extension that uh, you can install and use. It's similar to Singularity or to uh, Suzy. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you're interested, you can find out all about it there. Working on a, um, a new design, just like you know, SaaSlang is supposed to have a new design today. Um, I'm not going to have a new design out today, <laughs> but uh, um, it'll be, this current site is designed by me, and I'm not a designer. And the next site is actually designed by a real designer, so I'm happy for it to finally come out. Um, Normalize for SAS and Compass. Um, this is another one that it's it's a Compass extension. Um, also can be installed with Bower, um, and I really like Normalize.css. We'll talk a little bit about it later. Um, and this is just basically a I took uh, the original Normalize.css and just converted it to use Compass stuff. So it's a pretty straightforward port. Um, and then I've also done like some some IRC stuff. Um, there's a if you have subversion repositories lying around, go and convert them to Git immediately. Um, and then I'm probably most well known for the Zen theme for Drupal, um, which has had like a million downloads, which is pretty freaking crazy. <laughs> um, I'm working on a book, just like everybody else. Uh, <laughs> Uh, introduction to SAS and Compass out um, by O'Reilly. It's uh, due out sometime this winter. Um, you know, and damn it, truncation again. <laughs> May contain lemurs. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so um, the first couple slides that I was working on, uh, like I told Dale, uh, <laughs> completely thrown out. So that instead, I just have this slide of Dale. So do everybody think back to his presentation right now. Uh, okay, so that's that's my first five slides, right? <laughs> um, he talks about building sites um, from the outside in. <laughs> outside in. <laughs> um, and this is a sort of natural way that people were building sites when they weren't really thinking that much about it. So you, you know, start top left and just sort of work your way across the site. And you know, some of the, the problems with, with this approach, uh, and I'm going to need some, some high tech sound effects here for this, um, is <laughs> specificity, <laughs> right? Um, this is a term that uh, <laughs> this is a term that uh, malarkey. Oh man, what the heck is his actual name? Um, thank you, Andrew Clark uh, coined uh, specificity wars. This is where you 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 write a. Oh wait, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> this is where you um, write a selector, which seems kind of OK at the time. Um, and then you realize that at some other place in this site, you need to like override it. So you make it just slightly more specific. Um, and then you do this again. And it's <laughs> going kind of crazy now. Um, and you know, with, with SAS, you're like, oh, well, this looks awful. I can just rewrite it, right? So poof, 
much prettier. The problem is that you actually haven't fixed anything by doing this, right? <laughs> you still have the really awful um, output that generated CSS, right? Um, so, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, <laughs> not actually that good of an idea. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope this was photoshopped. I have no idea. I just found it on the internet. Um, so uh, the good news is, is that ah, damn stupid. It's not just Nicholas. Nicholas Gallagher. Wait. <laughs> Everything's truncated. Uh, <laughs> he he gave a great quote on. Um, he said, you know, are you new to front end development? You know, here's the secret. No one else knows what they're doing either. Um, <laughs> so the, the great thing about this is, is we're all learning at the same time, right? Um, the, you know, the, the, what did he call it? The UI component, or sorry, UI pattern stuff that Dale was talking about is sort of an emerging standard of how you build out sites sensibly. And that's the thing that we're going to be talking about at a much slower pace today. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I call them what are, I call them design components. You know, what are components? So basically the same thing as object and OOCSS. This was, um, <sighs> thank you. I'm just going to go to you. You just tell me all the names. I should have notes. I'll just, ha I'll just bring you to all my sessions from now on, cool. all my presentations. You like your, uh, your Ed McMahon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me your laugh. Andy <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Nicola Sullivan, she was the first, <laughs> first person to uh, come up with, uh, with this idea of object-oriented CSS. And uh, she was way ahead of the curve. Um, and the, problem with, the only problem with this idea was that when she came out with it, IE6 was still a very much a reality. So she presented this fantastic idea along with an actual you know, code base that had all this IE6 crap in it, because she had to at the time. right? So people were like, ah! I hate this. Um, but they were just sort of viscerally reacting to all the IE6 cruft because they're like extra wrapper stuff that you had to have, right? Um, but the idea was fantastic. And it's really taken off. It's, it's involved in all these other different things. It's the module part of the SMACS acronym um, block in uh, BEM's block element modifier. Dale was calling it UI pattern. I've heard it called patterns as well. These are all basically the same, same idea. Um, and the idea. The idea is that we have this ridiculous specificity that we have with our selectors. They're way too long. And our goal is actually to reduce the specificity of all of our selectors um, while also reducing the applicability, meaning that I want to have, my goal is to write like a single class that has this design applied to it. And anytime I use that class anywhere on the site and attach it to whatever HTML element, that thing will then become that design object. That's the goal. So the specificity becomes very low because it's you know a single selector or sorry, single class. The applicability, um, instead of having a sort of generic class name that might get like title, a lot of people use the class title um, and you use it in various different spots. The problem with using the word title as your class is that it's way too generic. Um, if you try to add style to it in one spot, it's going to bleed across your site and all these other places where you've used title. So we want to create a class name that's, that the name itself is specific to the design object. And it's not going to be used anywhere else. So it is this one design object, and it does nothing else. So it's not going to have any cascade coming across it from other design objects. Um, I'm, I think I'm almost at the end of my, my slides. I don't really have that many. I'm going to dive into code for the rest of it. Um, how many people here are familiar with SMACs? Actually, actually, let me reverse that. How many people here are not familiar with SMACs? OK. So the idea with SMACs is that it, he has uh, five different categorizations of styles. Um, and we're just going to talk about the very first three, the sort of fundamental three of it, and not worry about the other two for a minute. If you want to learn all about Smacks, you know, go to the Smacks website, right? Buy his book. That's great. Um, but at, at the sort of root level of our styles, we're going to first style 
all of our HTML elements, right? So each HTML element um, gets its own style. And this is a fantastic idea because um, there's this WYSIWYG problem that we often have with, you know, like a CMS site where people are editing their content online, they're using a WYSIWYG. Inside the WYSIWYG, it's really hard to, you know, get the WYSIWYG to add classes to a different thing or to get, you know, the, the editors, the content editors to learn how to add classes to different things. It's just really hard. So if we just have them entering in, uh, just having the WYSIWYG adding regular plain HTML elements, that's totally fine and easy to do. <laughs> and because that's the main spot of our page, then the, the default styling for our content area of our site should be the stuff, that's how we style these HTML elements. In my opinion, that should be the base of our HTML. And, and, and the, everything else is basically an exception to this rule. So like your header, your footer has like little teeny links, whatever. Those are exceptions to the, this is how I'm styling my content in the main part of my page. Right? So base styles, specificity is super low because it's just HTML element. Right? Then we have our page layouts. Um, again, these are probably just going to have uh, maybe one or two classes. So you have your um, just the sort of bare structure of your page. You're like, oh, okay, I'm going to put the header up here, sidebars over here, footer down here. There's some some wrapper divs that you have to put all your content in different place. So those are the layouts. And then we have the main chunk where most of the code for our site is is inside components, right? Um, and I'm going to jump out and we're going to look at actual code here. Let me pull up the actual site here. Um, okay. um, so, so here's, um, this is actually um, a site that I, I worked on, I recently switched jobs, um, but this is a site that I last worked on on my previous job, PRI.org. Um, actually, the designer who did the design is in the room, I think. There he is, Patrick, <laughs> Patrick Grady. Um, actually, yeah, I should pull up the website too. Yay, it worked. Okay, so um, this is PRI.org. Um, you know, it's fully responsive, and um, I'm going to use this as my example code for uh, for design objects here. So um, here's the sort of root level of our styling. Um, this is a Drupal site, so um, all of our CSS and JavaScript stuff are inside a specific folder inside the system. So we have a PRI folder that's the design bit, the, the theme of uh, the, just the Drupal site. Um, so we have our config.rb here, um, and then uh, I have it so that all my SAS files are inside a SAS directory, CSS, CSS directory. Um, and then here's the SAS directory. Um, and it's really there's only one file, styles.scss, that will cause an actual generated CSS to be created. Um, I'm not, I wish I had time to talk about all the like really cool things of, of SAS that we do in, in here. If we have time, I'll talk about the styles.ie81. That's pretty slick. Um, a friend of mine taught me that trick. Um, but uh, anyway, we're going to look at just styles.scss. Um, let me pop up the display text of this. So one of the things when you start using SAS is you'll notice there's sort of a natural order for doing some of the things in SAS because of the, uh, the variable defaults, that uh, exclamation default thing. Basically what you realize is that that means I have to declare all my variables first and then do the importing of all the compass extensions, right? Because I need to declare what my values are first and then import that stuff. So, um, so basically, you, you end up with this pattern of like, okay, variables, then import all my compass extensions, and then write my CSS. And that's basically what the styles.scss does as well. Um, I've got a single file here, init, um, that, and other people call it base. I think Dale called his config. It's the same thing. Um, inside init, um, I've done, 
yeah, at the top here, I'm just setting variables for various things. Um, this is uh, IE support that's part of the Compass uh, legacy support uh, module, which is great. Um, I use the uh, Compass's uh, vertical rhythm extension here. Um, you know, here's like my font stacks, some various colors. Um, and then finally at the bottom here, I add in all of uh, the module, the SAS extensions, the Compass extensions that I'm using. Um, and then last, I add my own sort of custom mixins. Um, I don't usually use this very often. It's just sort of there. Um, ended up using it once just as a wrapper around the breakpoint module, which is a fantastic. If you're not using breakpoint, totally should. Um, anyway, so that's our init. Um, and, and then start diving into smacks, right? So we have the base HTML styling. So styling each of our HTML elements is done with normalize. Um, and you can see here, I've just got a normalize.scss file. And the top here is, it's really similar to normalize.css. Um, it's just styling all these different HTML elements. There's a bunch of HTML5 support here. Um, and then we start to get into, you know, how we're styling our typography and stuff. Um, because typography is basically you're styling the HTML element, right? So all the typography ends up being the default style for HTML. Um, you know, do, 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 do. these are all just HTML elements being styled. Um, then after that, I've got all of my different layouts. Um, PRI website has, you know, what is it, eight different layouts there. Um, each one of these I've put inside a folder called layouts. Um, you can see that that my directory structure is, is a lot more simple than Dale's. Just layouts and components, those are the only two folders I, don't, I have. Um, so basically, you know, mine's a simplified version of his or his is a more extended version of mine, whatever. This is, if you start with this, you can build up to your own sort of organization style if you don't like it. But um, since there's not that many layouts, it doesn't really matter that much. So it's really easy to find all the different layouts. Um, this is the home page layout. Um, the classes that I'm using here are some, this naming convention is um, something I borrowed from Nicholas Gallagher, I believe, who, or no, no, it was in the Smacks book. Um, L dash, you know, the layout name, right? The, the L in front just indicates that, hey, this is a layout class. So when I see that in the markup, I know that that class is, you know, adding in the layout, right? So I don't ever use the same class names from a design object inside a layout. They're separate separate class names because they have separate um, separate goals, separate reasons to exist, right? So don't want to use any, um, you know, any other kind of class names, just the L dash whatever. Those are the layout and that's it. Uh, by the way, if, if anybody has any comments at any time, um, just start talking, you know. So you don't have to, I'm not trying to lecture, I'm just showing you what the way that I've been working. Good question. Yeah. So with normalize, are you if I understand correctly, you're changing normalize to your own, you know, uh, fonts and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, Nicholas shows uh, he wrote a blog post actually that talked about the two different ways that you can use normalize. One is like you just you just use it and then you override what you want in your own style. And the other way is basically to hack it all up. And um, I'm hugely in favor of just hacking it all up because. I don't, otherwise I just basically have to duplicate this file again with all of these HTML elements and then add my own styling. So it's like, why am I doing this twice? That makes right? a that, lot of sense. That's my objection with a lot of um, Eric Myers, the, the other Eric Myers uh, <laughs> reset style is that he does all this stuff and he's like, don't forget to you know, restyle all these HTML elements and never, I've never seen anybody restyle all the HTML elements. Plus, you know, HTML5 brings in all these other new HTML elements, there's a new HTML element, great, you just, you know, broke all these sites that no longer have styling for these new elements. 
Um, so yeah. So <laughs> sorry. I, I my only my only thought with that is, I've never actually for some reason thought that it makes a lot of sense. Um, how, how to say people going to work on this later on know that it's not just normalized? Like I I guess personally I would think to maybe prefix it with something like my own my initials normalized or you know the product normalized. Is that yeah sure I. I just tell other people that that I work on that, hey, this is a hack version of normalized, so they just sort of know. Um, and you know, in the the styles.scs, I, I guess I suppose I could better document that, right? I mean, it is showing that these are where the you know, the HTML element smacks you know base styles. That's where they go. And there's only one file, so. Um, but yeah, so you could rename that to be you know base.scss if you wanted to, if you wanted to follow. Smacks conventions. So that normalized file does that take into account compressing vertical rhythm, so like eight, all your H's, your H tags, and P tags, and anything? It it does. Um, that's one of the things that um, was that, that's part of the um, the port that I did for uh, from from regular CSS mm -hmm. to the compass version. So it it adds in all these things. Um, so basically, what I what I usually do is I go to my repo where I've got this, you know, and grab a copy either through Bower or, or whatever, right? So I grab a copy and then just start hacking at it to make it mine, right? So we have some variables here for font sizes that I can set those those variables. And that's all on um, in your init inside my init. Partial? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah. So th this is a good starting point for you, you know, the Compass version. So that's normalize. Those are our layouts. Did anybody else have any questions about the layouts part of it? Yeah. Uh, just about this sort of a general question about approaches to grid systems and the use of. So in, in this system, you have classes that you, like in your header file, uh, in the header.css file, right? So you're entering in. Um, this one? Yes, so you, you have to include uh, references to f classes that you're then adding into the header, is that correct? Yeah, into the markup, yeah. So it seems like it's a lot of extra work if um, the, the alternative would just be having your grid system set up with a bunch of classes and then you add a bunch of classes into the, uh, into the header, but you don't have to add references to them anywhere else, right? You just do it once, and then you just trickle those classes throughout. So you don't actually have to have all this code. But what, what, I mean, what are the advantages of, of um, doing it this way, as opposed to just? Right. So the, the, the reason why this site has a specific header layout file is because the header layout is way different than anything else on the site, right? I, I want layouts to be absolutely reusable. But the header layout, not reusable. It's just for the header section of every single page. It has a completely unique layout. Um, and let me show you the site so that you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So this uh, red thing up here, yeah. it sticks here. And ah, I have to resize the window. Oops, let me try that again. Yeah, it's totally cutting off this right edge of this page. Um, OK. There we go. <laughs> um, and you click on this, and so like all this nav bar <coughs> layouts, it's, there's no other place um, on the site that has a four column layout, right? So all of that layout is just used once. Right, so, so but you couldn't use like 25% width columns for that if you just had those classes. For instance, the, uh, the Inuit CSS has uh, with one half, with one quarter, with one third. So, mm -hmm. couldn't you just use those kind of classes here and with one one quarter to accomplish that? Yeah, you could. Okay. Right. right. I mean, the you know this um, this layout file was generated with send grids. Right. Um, no, I, which yeah, yeah uh, it it basically it provides no classes at all, like cl no class names at all. So you decide your own right. layout classes. You decide your own semantics. So you get to when you build a layout, you're deciding, okay, these are the classes I want to use for this layout, and then ZenGrids adds in the the right CSS for right. for that right. those classes. So, yeah, I could have used one third width and then yeah, use ZenGrids. It just is a way to like reduce that. the amount of CSS that you actually have to write to produce that layout. 
I guess that would be... Not necessarily. Okay. I mean... <laughs> Well, maybe. We, we can have a, like, yeah. a boff about that video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay. So layouts and then our components here. Right? Um, and if you look at it, that means I've got just a shit ton of files inside one directory. Um, and this... At first glance, this always freaks everybody out <laughs> when they first look at it. They're like, holy crap, I'm never going to be able to find anything. Um, it, it turns out not to be so bad. Um, I, I have had one person you know, validate my approach in that when I was working on this site, I had a new front-end developer come into the site um, about three-quarters of the way through it. And, and he was just like, ah, <laughs> when he saw it. Um, but because... Uh, all of our design components are named very specifically, um, like feature large. So he would go and inspect, he would look at the website the way it was, and he would see these classes and go, okay, I need to go find that you know, design object now. And wow, look, there's an actual file called feature large. Right? So the, the class name that you see in the markup becomes your roadmap for finding the actual file. And it's very fast to find the right file that you want to and just open it up. It's alphabetical order. right? <laughs> That's why I, I think globbing is a bad idea because you can easily just do one line and glob, glob them, but then you can't really tell what's being imported. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like having kind of like a roll up file that puts things together in the order that you actually want and then you call that from here. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, uh, I'm pretty sure that this is alphabetical order for most of these things. I put these first four just because they're not, they're sort of weird. Design components, you know, clear fix. Everybody knows what clear fix is, right? So they're, they're sort of sp special ones up here. But the rest of these are all just alphabetical order. Can you be show us what's in the uh, Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it. it um, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's just a. Uh, it's just a shortcut. Um, it. I don't think I use it very often. Um, I could go and search that and find out where it is. But do you do other state classes, so you have is hidden. Do you do any other stuff like that? Right. No. 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 The the hidden one is a special one because it's used in JavaScript all over the place and, and whatever. Um, but you're talking about this the snacks state, right? So the remind me to get to that right after I really talk about what a design component is. Okay. And then we can say. Because state is basically, it's part of a component. Mm -hmm. So you shouldn't have states that are separate from a component, because it's a state of a component. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. OK. Um, so let's look at what an actual component is. So now we're going to go back to my last slide, I think, here. Oh, wait. Actually, I should talk about this one. Yeah. So. So you, you saw that my the directory structure is the first three levels of Smacks. Base styles, layouts, and components. Layouts and components are the only ones that have like a bunch of files in them. So I created a separate folder. If I had a bunch of files for base styles, then I could create a separate folder to hold all those things. I just have one, normalized. So I just put it in the root. Right? Um, but that's the, the folder structure. Um, here is. <laughs> so this square box is around a single component. Um, and this is a fairly complex design component. Um, but basically, you know, we have this, this, this label over here. We have this image here, a title here. There's some sort of metadata here about this article. And then some article text right here. Um, and this whole thing um, I've named feature large. So the, the wrapper div for this actually has this class, feature-large. And then all of these individual things um, have their own class names. Um, because that's how you want to structure um, a design component. Um, actually, a super, super simple design component would just be like your button class. Right? You just have a single class. It defines how buttons look on your site. So you like dot button, and you add in your button styles. Right? It does not have any parts to it. it 
I mean, it's just dot button, right? Um, and uh, you know, let me show you button class really first, just because that's so much simpler. Um, <laughs> button. Okay. So here I've got uh, my by button class the styles, uh, the 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 states, you know, are here, right? Um, and um, oh, this was a horrible idea. I need to fix that, and then next time I do a project, um, that's just a hack. I was like, ah, I screwed up. Um, and then this is um, what's called a, a variant, right? Or a, a, a modifier. I've heard it called both things. Um, so we we have our default button element up here, and this one is a sort of a tightened, tightened version of it because our default button is actually the width of whatever container it's in. Right. And this one is basically saying, okay, shrink wrap that around the text. So we have this variant where it's button dash dash tight. Um, and the, the, the naming convention that I've been using is one that Nicholas Gallagher suggested and then rejected later, I, don't, I think. But anyway, so <laughs> he, he likes camel case now, I think, plus some double dashes. Um, anyway, uh, the, the component name is in this first part, and if you have a, you know, like you need a long name, like feature large, and then it's, be, you know, feature dash large becomes the component name, right? And any variants of that are, um, have the dash dash here. So the button dash dash tight tells you that is a variation of the default component. Um, and because it is a variation of the default component, it's in the same file, right? So, Right, so we're using extend here to extend the button. So when you apply this button dash dash tight to a particular button, it gets all the button styling anyway. So you don't have to have button and button dash dash tight on That's it. That's referring to the, what about the class name. Here? Yeah. Um, that uh, is the Sorry, yeah, silent selector. Um, it, it's basically, it's a, um, placeholder. Yeah, placeholder selector. Um, uh, yeah. So, ev do, who here doesn't know what a placeholder selector is? I guess. Okay. 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 <laughs> I, I know what they are, but I don't understand why you have both placeholder yeah. and. Fair enough. Um, so the the question was, uh, why do I have both a regular class and a um, a placeholder s selector, right? Yeah. Um, and I'll answer that in a second after I explain what, what the selectors are. So let's, so you, you, you know what extends are, right? So the, the default way that extends worked before SAS 3.2 was you could extend a specific class name. The problem was with doing it that way is that it looks through the entire code base and any place that that class name is used, it you know, then puts in this class name and so it can get sort of crazy, it'll like create a, tons and tons of, of selectors on all these rules that you didn't actually intend to uh, if you're not careful. Um, I, before SAS 3.2 was used, I ended up writing like fake class names. <laughs> so I think I called them dot placeholder, you know, dash, right? Because I knew the feature was coming. But, you know, I created these fake class names so I could really control, okay, when I say extend, it's just this one rule that I want to extend. So percent button, I'm not using percent button anywhere else in the code base. So I know that it's only this rule that this is going to extend. Right. So extend actually functions differently for real class names and placeholders. It works differently. Yeah. Well, it actually, I mean, it works the same. So if I had percent button oh, somewhere else using, in, my, cla right, in, my, in right. my code base, it would do the same thing as right, dot right, button. Right. Right. But I'm not. Right. right. It's more specific and only applies to the extend. Right. Yeah, yeah. So if if we if I didn't have this dot button here, um, and I didn't modify this in any other way, um, and actually if I sorry if I deleted this section and just had the the percent button here, if nothing it actually extended percent button, this entire rule set would not go into the generated CSS because nobody extended it. Therefore, it's not a real rule set. It's only when you extend it, or like I've added my own selector here, that it gets put into the generated CSS. So the question about why both, 
Um, so you, you only ever extend placeholders, right? Yeah. I don't ever okay. extend class names right. because I just find it too problematic. And that's why. And then you also want to use the class name in the HTML. Yeah. So that's those are the two reasons, right? Right. Yeah. So I want to. I want to. I just got in the habit of doing this for every single yeah. rule set, Smart. whether or not I actually needed to extend it outside of this file or not. Because sometimes I find that I, I've, I've built a component and like, oh, actually, I do need to extend it from this other component because there's like a sub piece that uses the same styling. So then I just sort of extend out into this, and I don't have to modify it. It's just available. Um, yeah, w whether or not you have both of those, it doesn't really matter. You know. Um, now let's look at uh, how are we doing for time? Um, yeah, we're doing all right. I think I've got ten more minutes. Um, let's look at the feature large one. Now this one is more complex. Um, here we have our our pieces. So feature. Actually, this is the one spot where I screwed up because the <laughs> the file name should be the same as the actual component. Um, so the fact that they're not means that that's a bug in my code. <laughs> um, but this is all a really good example, besides that point, um, of what a design component is. Um, so feature is our, the name of our component. Um, so the wrapper of it, that big div, gets, gets that class. Sometimes I don't end up having any styles actually applied to the wrapper. Um, or, or sometimes there isn't a wrapper, and that's fine too. Um, so if you have a component that ends up being just like two sibling HTML elements, that's totally cool. Um, you don't have to have a wrapper, um, but you should still give it a name, like feature in this case. Um, and then each of those, the pieces inside the component, uh, I'm telling you that this is a sub part of this feature by putting double underscore. So the title, which is you know the title of this article, right, in big font. Um, so it's feature underscore underscore title. And then you know that when I use that class, it's getting this style, which is a, a subcomponent or a subpart or what do they call it in, in BEM? Block element in block, block element modifier. Right? Um, and when, when we first started doing this, and, and I used to work with Greg and, and Patrick here at uh, Palantir.net, and when we first started doing this, we're like, OK, wait. But if we have, we started thinking about our, our HTML, our DOM structure, and and we thought, OK, so we've got a title, which is a piece of it. And then we've got a link inside the title. So that's a sub sub component. And stop you know, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. It's not, it's not a sub sub component. Um, the, the title and the title link are just two separate things, two separate parts of your component. You don't have to go crazy with like another title and then underscore underscore link again. Don't need to go that crazy with your with your naming structure. So underscore underscore title uh, and underscore title dash link. Uh, so we know that this is the name of our piece of our components. Um, and then here's this a state right here. Um, this is a smack state. So is hover. Um, we're, we're, so when you hover over this link. Uh, we want to have uh, this color orange and it's dark gray by default. And you notice I don't have HTML or I don't have any class names here. And that's because of um, I found that it can be problematic with the, the link and the hover and the focus stuff to put that inside a component directly. Um, especially if because if I'm if I've been a if, like, say, I'm in a different component and I want to like extend this exact same styling, if I have link and hover over there, then it just like, smush, smushes together, and then I have like double hovers, and so I try to keep them separate. And what I end up doing is later on in the file here, I'm going to extend that. Um, where is it? Here. So feature title, um, and for, this is the the other thing I. I wasn't actually, because this is generated with a CMS, I wasn't actually able to go in and add in that link class that I really wanted to easily. I could have done it, because you can do anything with Drupal, but it would have taken me like five hours. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so instead, I, I wrote, this is my, my fugly selector workaround. Right? So you write the actual selector that, that's inside 
you know, the generated markup. Um, and then I extend the, you know, the, the pure component piece here, right? So my fugly selector here is extending the actual component that I want. And because my fugly selector is pretty specific, um, it's not going to go all over the place with the cascade either. So I wasn't sure if this would work at first, but it actually worked great because I, I still controlled the cascade. I didn't have any bleed over any styles. Um, and it allowed me to not spend five hours to get a, you know, this stupid little class name inside a link. Right? Um, so here, um, feature title A, and then our link and visited states. Um, and we're extending the, the regular title link. And then our hover and focus states, um, title link is hover, that part of the component, the state component. Um, and yeah. So underscore underscore is a sub part of the component, meaning the title is within the feature. Yep. Um, show us again the double dash where it extends, or not extends, but show us again the double dash with feature. Like, um, sure. I so don't, it like builds upon. I don't think that feature is probably extended doesn't have anywhere. One. Yeah. Um, so for example, an alert box maybe. Alert box, mm -hmm. alert box dash dash warning would be, a, it would use alert box, but it would style it differently because it's a warning or success or info or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, but, but in the alert box, there could be a title or paragraph or a button or something. I think, yeah, actually here, this is exactly what you're just talking about. The, the default uh, class in Drupal for alert boxes is messages, Okay. right? So messages and then um, just a regular status message is dash dash status, warning, error, so our class names then become these, you know, messages dash dash error. These are variations of the default, gotcha. right? Because it's mostly the same CSS, just like mm -hmm. a little tweak, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, we're using different icons inside mm -hmm. it. So these are different background icons for like, warning has like a big stop sign or, or whatever, or error has a stop sign and warning has a yield sign or something like that, right? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Another. Where's OK come from in there? Where's, oh, oh, wait. Extend OK. Extend OK. Uh, that one, I think, is a Drupalism. Don't really, I wouldn't worry about it. That was encouragement. You were just no, here it is. <laughs> yeah, this is a Drupalism. Don't, don't do OK in warning and error. These are way too generic, but they're all over Drupal. OK. <laughs> we are five. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Morton and I are trying to get rid of rid of them in, in Drupal 8. So you got another question right here. Um, I just wanted to, uh, if you could go back to your hidden file, which was so lovely. <laughs> sure. Um, I just I wanted to point out something that you've done here um, that is really great for maintainability, which is your JS dash hide class. Anytime you want to do something with JavaScript um, w with an L do something to an element with JavaScript, it's a really good idea to prefix that with JS because that lets other people know when they come in later that that class is associated with functionality and not styles so that they can mm -hmm. safely move it and mm -hmm. the styling won't break or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that's a really great idea that I stumbled upon recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it is great. Um, when you talk about Smacks, uh, one of the, the, the fourth level of, of the five that he's got is, uh, so you have base, then layout, then your components, and then state. Right? Usually, state is just basically like hover or uh, you know of a component. Right? It's a, it's a very it's a you know this component when it's in this particular part of the application, like some just any kind of state. So like you've just submitted the form, like that could be a state, right? Or I'm hovering over it. That's a state, right? Um, the other kind of state is one that's you know, f done by JavaScript, right? And I usually like to keep those class names separate from the design component class names because exactly what you said. So when you look in the markup and you see that class, you know that this is, you, you've separated the ability to manipulate this with JavaScript versus styling it with, with CSS, right? Um, because a lot of times is if you go and refactor all of your like CSS because you need to, and you rename some design component because it makes more sense now because you've added all these new si sections of your site and you refactor your components because they're used differently in different pages, you change the class name and now you broke your JavaScript. 
But if you use JS dash whatever it is that you're doing in JavaScript, your JavaScript remains working. Um, OK, let's go back to style. Oops, styles.scss. So yeah, just components, doo -doo -doo -doo, that's it. And then I've got like a print style sheet. Um, I, I'm pretty much done with the design components. I can show you other hacks or if you have more questions. We'll talk about, let's talk about more web components, or sorry, design components some more, I think, first. Um, question in the back there. Um, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to, to ask this question, but I was wondering, could you do like a faux demo of the workflow if you were had to like add a new component to this project? So a creative director comes to you and says, listen, the client They would come or, to Patrick, by the way, not to me. But go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, we need a brand new component that currently does not exist in any of these partials. Could you do a faux kind of like how you go about adding this new component? Well, the first thing is that I would look at it in, in context. OK. Um, so um, if we go back to the actual site, um, I would, I would look and see. Ah, there we go. I would look and see. Well, does this? Usually, they're not thinking about components, right? Because that's an implementation thing. They're thinking about designs. Sometimes they've got, they if they have a um, a style guide, fantastic, right? Um, so maybe they will reuse like some style that's already in their style guide. In which case, it's not really a new component at all, right? I just need to apply those classes to this new functionality on this new site. But if it really is a completely new design, I still would go and look at the site and say, are there pieces of this new design that match design that already exists on the site? Because I can reuse them. And if I can't quite reuse them, maybe I can refactor it so that I can reuse it. Right? So um, that would be the very first thing that I would do. Um, and if I, if I can't reuse any of the styles, First off, what, what the hell? But anyway, <laughs> if I can't reuse any of the styles, it's really easy. I just uh, think about um, what name I want to give it. Naming stuff. Well, I'll talk about naming stuff right after this. Um, I think about what name I want to use for this new thing. And the name is, uh, should make sense for this site. Right? Um, and then once I've decided on name, I just create a file uh, called underscore my new thing. And then I'm going to go inside my uh, styles.scss file. And let's see, I'm, I'm doing this for alphabetic order, so it's easier for me to find. Oh. So like an example, maybe. You know. So let's say the creative director or someone comes to you and says, um, I need a dialog box on this page. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what your, your site tree looks like. I can just pick a page. Um, I don't have a dialog uh, component, so I'll just create a dialog component. Here we go. Um, right. Save. Go and create a new file mm -hmm. called underscore dialog.scss. This is a partial. Right. Mm -hmm. Put it inside the components directory. Start writing. Um, actually, I guess you want me to do that, so let me do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Where's my mouse? Here it is. OK, so I'm inside my PRI. Um, dialog, right? Mm -hmm. OK, so here's my dialog. So I start with this, right? And that I would add in the styles that are for the wrapper, right? Um, I know that sometimes you can have multiple. You end up with like multiple, multiple warnings or multiple like status messages because you screwed up twice on this form, for example, right? So sometimes you'll have like a a a list of items that you need to respond to. So like, I would just like okay, I need to style that comp that part of the component. So I'll call it dialog list. Right, um, and um, so, so uh, let's just say that the, the icons are not background icons, but actual images, for mm -hmm. example, in this case. So like dialog icon, right? Um, and then I would go and, and see if I have control over the markup and can actually add 
these real names inside the markup as classes. That's what I prefer to do. Um, so let's say I'm able to do that for here. So I'm just like, oh, OK, great. So I'll, I know I can do it for this one. Um, the list, I can't control it because it's uh, generated by you know, the CMS. And I can't figure out how to do that. Um, so then I'll come down here and I'll write my like fugly selector, right? So the the since I was able to get it added, the dialog class actually added to the markup, but not to the list. Um, then I could do something like this, right? Or maybe it has some ridiculous um, my CMS sucks has some like ID on the <laughs> UL, right? <laughs> but, but let's say um, you did have let's say you did have access to the markup, so you could hook a class onto the LIs. Um, how, see, so, you, so you, you're really comfortable with this code base at this point. So you kind of have a really gra good grasp of like all the patterns that exist. Mm -hmm. One thing I've been struggling with is I, I work with um, a team of five to six designers who all have different varying levels of knowledge when it comes to SAS and even CSS. And so just knowing, for them knowing that they can extend some sort of style that I've done for a list item mm -hmm. somewhere else has, has been kind of a challenge. And I was, Curious to see how you how you guys approach that with with this with this project. Sure. So uh, th that's actually that's totally uh, something that we've come across with this site too, because you'll see these like these share icons. Mm -hmm. um, they're all over the site, right? So this is a piece of this featured module or this featured uh, component, but it's also a piece of all these other things, which right. are slightly different components, right? Um, even down here. It's all the exact same styling. So what it, what it ends up happening is that if this start, like if this was not true before, it was only used one place. Let's say it was only used in the feature. Right. And then later on, they're like, hey, we're going to put it here. So then we'll go, you know what? I need to refactor this. Instead of making that just a piece of this, a, a component, my feature component, I'll make it a whole new component called uh, you know, share count. Right? So, so at that point, and that becomes a new component. Um, and then I. You know, if I can modify the markup in all the different places to add in the new class name, okay. that's the way I would do it. Right? Gotcha. So you, ideally, you would go refactor and be like, OK, now I need to abstract this, what used to be a very specific class name mm -hmm. that was all namespace. I need to now abstract that and create yeah. an extend for and, it. And, th and this is actually the way it is. This, this, is, this is a sub piece of this design object, but it is also a design object in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So this is just a link. Uh, like if you looked at the markup, it's just A with a class name on it, you know, and the number 53 or whatever it is, right? So there's just content inside it. Um, and if inside this design component I needed to do something different to it, like maybe position it slightly different, they're all positioned exactly the same on this site. But let's say on this com design component they wanted it down here, right? Right. So then I would I would actually have two class names on it. One is the the component name share count, and the other would be you know whatever I can't remember what these are called, but whatever this thing is, uh, call, news call or something. Box or I don't something. know what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, news list or something like that. Let's say it's news list. So news list uh, underscore underscore uh, share, right? That would be the class that it would give it as a as a piece of this larger component, and then I could position it down here. Are you and hooking just do the that positioning onto? I, sorry, I, I guess I wasn't. I can't remember where I actually put the positioning for this, to be honest. <laughs> well, my question is, like, okay, if you have two classes, mm -hmm. uh, at this point, do you have two separate classes on your markup for that for that share icon, or do you create a, a new class as the, as a, like this is a unique component now because it's in a different position? Uh, the the way that the way that it's no the way that I th have thinking about it is. It is, since it is its own component already, sure. it's got that one class, and that does the one styling everywhere, right? Okay. And instead of having context-specific, like, oh, if this is inside one of these design objects, then I'd have it do something else. Context-specific um, selectors kind of suck because they start to bleed. They, they, you've mm -hmm. increased the specificity. Um, you've uh, they, they, they go with the cascade. They require the cascade, and we want to reduce those as much as possible. So instead of doing that context specific thing where it's this uh, news list class space, you know, share count, um, instead I would add a new class to this, and it would be news list 
um, underscore underscore share. So it would be, I'm now styling this sub part of this larger component. It just happens to get a, its styling is down here. But, but it would, you would here. not consider that a like a layout class at that point? Or, or is that now we're just kind of splitting the, hairs at that, that point? A, a little bit splitting hairs. Okay. When, when I, the way that I usually tackle layout is it's just about large chunk mm. moving the page around, right? Like, like doing this image to the right of this text, I don't really usually consider it page layout, right? So it's part of this design component, and you know this layout is part of this design component. So it goes inside the layout component or inside the component. Yeah. Thanks. So so to sort of. Um, uh, take that implication then. So you'll never extend outside of a component or very rarely unless it's the base stuff? Um, and if you do, how do you document that? I do extend out of, uh, out of my across components sometimes. I try to limit that, but like it's part of the toolkit. I can do it with SAS, right? Um, so especially at the end of a project, I'll definitely do that, right? <laughs> rather than try to refactor, right? So yeah, and the, and the thing is, is that um, because it's you're compiling all this stuff, I'm pretty sure you can extend something before you actually define it, right? It's not going to cause an error, so it sh it should be right. So like if you had some component to begin with A and you wanted to extend something that's in started with E. There's no problem. You just. Did you do that with that OK extend thing? Yeah, yeah, you're right. I did. So that doesn't cause an error. Otherwise, this site would be completely broken right now. <laughs> so, um, any other questions? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. One over here. Do I have five more minutes, or am I five minutes over? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Thanks. So with that news list, like. If you're to position like that uh, share icon somewhere else, how would you really organize that in the file in the file structure? Like, where would you put that news list class, uh, position class, or whatever you want to call it? Uh, you know what? Let's figure out what I actually called this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Um, but this is one of the other things that's great about um, you know this structure is that if you have no you're new to this code base, you know I'm going to go down here. God, I hope this works. <laughs> Um, oh, look, I called it a story list. Uh, story list, um, and it looks like, yeah, right there. There's my story list um, wrapper right here. Um, all these divs are, a lot of it's generated with, um, by Drupal. Um, so actually, I, uh, oh, yeah, I had to do something funky here. That was just a weird design thing. I had to nest a, a layout inside a component and then finish the rest of the component. Um, but that's just because of the way this design worked. It, um, if, the, if the layout of like, oh, I'm just going to put this image over here is, is part of the component without needing like this heavy lifting stuff that I needed because uh, it's like, it's centered, no, anyway, it's a weird design thing that I had to do this nesting thing that I don't usually do. Well, as we're referring more to that circle, like that's like you know, that's the number of shares I take it. Right. So, so story list. Oh yeah. Right. Right. So story list. Um, here's story list image. Um, there are other things in here somewhere that are story list underscore underscore whatever. So now I'm going to go back to our, my code base, and um, it's inside the components directory, of course. Um, story. Man, I hope this works. Story list. Right. So here's. Um, Here's the component and all of its sub pieces, images, titles, title link, title link. Um, if I, you know, like I said, like I said, if I was wanting to add story list specific styling to that, I don't even know what I would do. Like, oops. Uh, Bottom zero or something like that, right? To put it on the bottom, right? Okay. That's yeah. that's how I do it. So, 
Um, I am going to show you one more trick since we've got a minute and a half. <laughs> um, and that is this. So that, that's how I generate the styles uh, .css with this file, which we've just been talking about. Um, and a lot of times I'll have uh, IE hacks that I need to deal with. And the way that I'll do that is um, if there's like a specific, like in one rule set, I have the, like some, some awful properties that I have to add in for IE 8 and lower. I'll actually put a, a wrapper around that. And I'll say like if uh, legacy support, uh, what are those? If legacy support, where is it? Um, it's in my init. So legacy support for IE 6, right, for IE 8. I'll say if this, uh, then add these extra properties to this rule set. Now, by default here, init, uh, these variables are false. And that's the way it is when styles.css is generated, because styles.scss doesn't do anything with this. But I've got this styles ie8 one. And now I'm going to set ie8 to true. Right? So anytime in the code base, and, and here I am importing styles. So I'm importing the regular style sheet into the ie8 one. And basically, it creates a whole new style sheet that's almost a duplicate, except that it's IEH specific only. Now, so I've got one style sheet for everybody else that has all the rules that without the IEH cruft in it, and one style sheet that has all the rules except for, you know, includes all the IEH cruft. And they're separate. And then I use conditional comments inside the head part of my page to you know, load the regular style sheet for, for everybody else. And on IE8 and lower, just load the IE8 style sheet and not the other one. So you really don't care about load time on IE8? No. So you duplicate it. <laughs> no, 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 no. But see, I haven't duplicated it. But if you import the styles twice, though, right? No. No, there's the conditional styles. Here, let me show you. I, um, I don't actually care that much about IE load time. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> So, do, 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 do. Oh, no, wait, no. Yeah, here it is. Um, wow, I should turn on aggregation on this site. Um, this, wait. Wait a second. Sorry, no, no, wait. I was, it was just, this is the spot I'm looking for. Oh, wait, aggregation is on. Thank God. Okay. I was going to have to port a bug. <laughs> okay. Um, so, here it is. Um, Right here. So this is like called a down level conditional whatever. It's really funky syntax. Um, and let me see if I can zoom in on this. And I can't. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So basically, this says um, if IE9 or greater or not IE, then use this style sheet. Um, otherwise, if less than IE9, use this style sheet. So every standard compliant browser knows nothing about these comments. And this particular comment, because of this funky thing going on right here, thinks it's just a single CSS comment. So it just ignores it and then just loads this like normal. And IE8 goes, oh, this is a special comment. I'll listen to this and go, oh, well, this doesn't match for me because I'm IE8. Therefore, I won't load this style sheet. I'll just load this one. For Nate, Nate Hogg showed me that trick. I was like, oh, damn. So that's, that's really nice. You can separate. It actually reduces the amount of CSS that you send to all the other clients because it doesn't have all the IE8 cruft in it. And actually reduces the, the amount that you send to IE8 as well because you can remove some media queries that it doesn't understand. Right. So but it is almost like duplicate code you said, It's right? It's duplicate code except that it's, it's just that one file with like eight lines of code in it that causes it to be double, right? right. So you, you've separated it in the generation but inside your actual code base, you see everything in context. Right? So you're, like, you're working on a design component. Oh, here's a little i8 hack that's part of the design component. And it's marked up with the, that variable name. Right. Yeah, the if, and, the if conditional and the variable name. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>